Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is Ukraine War frontline update for the 29th of February 2024. Uh, this, I am going to do a somewhat, well I'm not going to go into the Institute for the Study of War to, to go through a granular appraisal of the frontline, but it is what it is. If you don't know what lines on my map mean, please pause the video and check out what's on the screen at the moment. Right. Thank you to JL who's done the mapping again. He is just uh, an insanely good human being. And if anyone wants to challenge me on that, I'll have them. Um, he's stated that, let's have a look at the Russian losses and gains as he's added them up. So Andrew Perpetua has uh, Russian gains at 11.65 square kilometers and Russian losses at 0 0.06 square kilometers. In other words, although you can see some blue uh, areas there, really the Russians have, have made the majority of the gains. Um, Surat Maps has it uh, a little bit more in favor of the Ukrainians, but... Uh, no, the, the Russians have made much larger gains of 12.13 square kilometers and the Russians have lost 2.12 square kilometers. So about a, a 10 kilometer net gain there for Syriac mats for the Russians. Anyway, that gives you a, a sense of what's going on in totem. Right. Before we look at the individual parts of the map, the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Alexander Sursky, has named the main tasks currently facing the Defence Forces. Quote, my main task is to effectively use the combat capabilities of the weapons and the military equipment of our units to inflict maximum losses on the enemy and destroy a significant part of his artillery and armour vehicles to maintain the occupied positions and restore the positions we were where we retreated. I mean... I don't think there's anything to <laughs> that's particularly new or genius there. However, it is stating that attrition of equipment is is one of the main targets. Now, that's what I was talking about at the beginning of the Ukrainian counteroffensive when they went to Manitok uh, and and lost all that equipment and then decided to sit back and spend their time attriting Russian uh, equipment. And I think that's what you are seeing and continuing to see. I think that's one of their main objectives. And it's it, I think it underwrites what they're doing in Krinky, for example, I talked about it yesterday. Andrew Perpetua agrees with that. It's just been incredibly good for them. So the success uh, using those metrics of success for the Ukrainians there has been has been very good. It's not about taking back the territory, you see, restoring the position where we retreated. Well, that hasn't happened there. So that is just one of these earlier ones of uh, inflicting maximum losses on our enemy and destroying significant part of their artillery and armored vehicles using the capabilities of our weapons and military equipment, so drones and and. Uh, artillery there for example so uh yep yeah, okay thank you for that and just to to let you know the the latest this is the sea of azov here uh sort of up past crimea under the kirch bridge you get this sea and there was there was a rumor that maybe a submarine has been hit because a submarine's been seen on satellite imagery being towed in Novorossiysk. it might be normal that that's been towed it's completely normal thing for a submarine at certain times or in certain contexts or it might have been hit there could be some issue with it uh, there was a a bit of a Andre Yermak hint of you know eyes looking one way and a ship um, and it you know PS01 was saying another submarine question mark but in the sea in the sea of Azov the occupied ship was on fire Russians suffered losses uh, so a fire was recorded on one of the Coast Guard boats of the Border Service of the FSB. Border Service, FSB, Coast Guard, you know, who knows. Russian Federation in the waters of the Sea of Azov. A fire engulfed the wheelhouse of the Russian vessel. The enemy suffered losses in the amount of five occupiers. The boat crew urgently called an evacuation team. So that uh, seems to be taking place at the moment somewhere in the Sea of Azov. Right. As you can see, no changes to the northeastern access from Kupiansk to Svatova to Kremina. And indeed, no changes to Bakhmut either, which is really good news because it's been very difficult around Ivanivka and up near Bodonivka of late. Uh, so that's really good to see a bit of stabilization there. Uh, but it's looking pretty challenging around the Avdivka area. So as you can see, all the mappers agreeing that some gains have been made around Padici, uh, gains have been made through Olivka. But we'll talk about Olivka because there are claims that the Ukrainians have pushed the Russians back out of there, or at least to push back. The Russians gain in Tonyenka, and then further down towards the Pervomysky salient here in the, uh, in the fields uh, between uh, Vodjanye, really, and Tonyenka. So that is some fairly consistent and concerning games for the Russians in that area. Although, as I've said, not to be completely 
uh, it's, it's not to come out of the blue. We're expecting that, and I'd expect the Ukrainians to uh, to retreat back behind the uh, bluff of this higher ground here behind the river, as that will help them a lot in their defence. But they're they're pro probably going to bleed the Russians as much as they can in that. Uh, operational withdrawal and then there are some gains around Novelsky. this to me is worrying uh, and it's worrying because I see that as a very important place just like I see Pobjeda uh, as as an important place too for stopping these larger uh, encirclements and indeed that's actually what's mentioned in the Euromaidan press here um, yeah so uh, although it talks about Kurokove being a new place to uh, that the Russians, well, it's not a new place, but it, it, it's clear that Russia shifts its axis of attack east towards Kurokovo. They're trying to flatten that with uh, aviation bombs. But frontline villages like Novomikhailovka and Pobjeda are the key in blunting the offensive. Control of supply routes is critical. Ukraine manages to reclaim half of Pobjeda in a counterattack. Uh, and that's exact, it goes to exactly what sometimes I I do tell you uh, that that's validated my opinion and i only tell you that because i have this self-doubt and i'm just an imposter imposter syndrome i don't know what i'm talking about it's just what i picked up over a couple of years of talking to you guys right so uh, when when proper an analysis bears out what i've been saying i just it's not that i feel good about myself it's just like it's an awareness that that i'm on the right track because i don't want to mislead you guys if i mislead you guys then i have uh, you know what am i doing so Pobjeda is important and it's super important to me as a key to keeping the Russians back. And that's indeed what the Euromaidan press is saying. And again, as I say, Novelska down here. So let's now go and look at Avdivka a little more closely. We'll start with looking at Syriac maps that, as you can see, just huge gains there right across the board uh, with the Ukrainians pushing back to or, or pulling back, sorry, towards that river. So the Surat Maps tweet says Russian army has entered Badichi, that's at the north here, taking control over half the village. As a result, the Ukrainian army retreated to Semenivka from the southern plantations, which forced troops to retreat from Olivka too. Only in the northwestern part, the locality remains contested and not secured by Russian troops. Moreover, Russian forces entered in most of Tonyenka, so that's down here. Uh, except the northern part, which still is under Ukrainian control, and the southern plantations of the Severny. Uh, so I presume that's kind of around this area, or maybe around there. Uh, that Severny is a, is a it's a village. Now, I think um, this was from 16 hours ago, so there has been activity since then. Uh, Third Assault and 25th Airborne Brigades have bravely defeated the enemy who have broken through to the outskirts of Olivka, according to Sirsky. The situation remains difficult. He took measures to allocate the additional resources of ammunition as well as reserves. So they are piling in what they can to help defend Olivka here, uh, which is very close to the river, very close to being backed against that bluff there. Uh, but the claim is that they, they have pushed the Russians back in, in that particular area. Uh, here we have Getty saying Olivka, the 3rd Assault Brigade, and the 25th Brigade had knocked out the enemy from the outskirts of Olivka. So that's about 1.15 square kilometres. So actually, when we're talking about what the latest square kilometre uh, calculations are that JR did earlier, it doesn't appear to be taking into account any movement here because, of course, Surat Mats has not admitted or hasn't reacted to that yet. That's older mapping. They might have done so already uh, since JR has done the mapping since I've looked, but it it appears that, that the Ukrainians might well have pushed the Russians back there, which is really good news. Uh, and then down in this Novelsky area, the Russians made new advances southeast of Novelsky, reaching the outskirts of the settlement. And that is definitely concerning for me. Uh, I think that's an important... Um, settlement it's a tiny agricultural place as it is uh, the ukrainians are very well dug in there now the consequences of the ukrainian failure to build a strong second defensive line behind avdivka over the past two years is playing out now russian forces have advanced six to seven kilometers west of avdivka in the past week at a consistent rate now i was under the impression that the russian the ukrainians were building defenses further back here and the reason they hadn't built defenses around here well, I think primarily because they weren't weren't expecting to lose the amount of land that they did as quickly as they did. So that's a, as I keep saying, a combination of not having any material uh, or artillery ammunition, and which you know they they you could criticize them for not having planned in that contingency uh, of being too confident in relying on out, outside help for continued procurement of ammunition, but 
on the other hand, they just weren't expecting to lose that that area. And you know, for, for the carb and the FAB bombs that have been mullering this entire region, I think that they just and troops coming in on, under sewers and water pipes in the uh, Saska or Hotter area down here. I think it just unseated them rather quickly, uh, and and they've been caught with their pants down to some degree. Uh, there is a lot of criticism about Ukrainian lines of defence, but I I heard previously that they were building defences in these areas. I'd be interested to see what the actual state of play is. I know Andrew Perpetua is is absolutely uh, nonplussed. He's he's really angry about the Zelensky uh, Zelensky government not having done enough here and he had he had a big talk about it on his live stream the other night with Constantine saying well the reality of the situation was that neither the army nor the government kind of they they wanted it done but neither side were prepared to kind of put the logistics and and money I, sp I suppose into doing that you know for a long time now uh, but of course that that's not really any long term excuse that's an explanation maybe but of course you just got to someone's got to get on and do it and the government has to facilitate how that does they how that happens they are ultimately responsible uh, you know we've seen that the russians themselves got in loads of contractors to do all their digging and that they were they were big on that a huge uh, huge undertakings that the Russians did, and and now they're they're you know they're reaping the rewards of that forethought. Okay, so that is that. We're moving on to uh, Krasnohorivka. Okay, so let's come down from this whole Avdivka area where it's it's looking pretty challenging. Now come to Krasnohorivka, and as you can see, there's a there's a blue pin there, a rare blue pin, which indicates that the Russians have been pushed back from there. Uh, so let's go and see what is said about here. So it's all right, maps it doesn't show any Ukrainians pushing back. It says that the footage shows, recent footage shows, the Russian army uh, entering into the first part of Krasnoharivka, attacking the Ukrainian positions on the street of Berezhnya. Uh, so we'll get that uh, footage geolocation and taking control over the first houses in the streets of Shevchenka and Parizkoy uh, Komuni. So, as I say, we'll find out where those two streets are uh, on our map and see where the Russians were. So that's, yeah, just down in, in this area there. Um, they are, and, and that's the other one, uh, Komuni. So possibly, as Surat Maps entails with their, their mapping there, possibly taking control, at least for some time, of the streets in that area. However... Uh, it, it appears that Ukrainians might well have pushed them back out. So third assault brigade says it knocked out the Russian forces from Krasnoharivka. They seem to be quite active because they're also up in Avdivka, forcing the Russians out of Orlivka. So a very busy group of soldiers. So soldiers of Ukraine's third assault brigade said yesterday that they drove the Russian troops out of the city of Krasnoharivka. According to the Ukrainian military, the day before Russian forces attacked the southeastern part of Krasnoharivka and entered the town. Uh, and there's evidence of them clearing out uh, areas there. I don't know about geolocation for that footage, but there is footage available, first person footage of cleanup operations in the southern part of the settlement. So that does appear to be uh, genuinely confirmed. Frontline report again, as mentioned, that, that it, it's all about these places of Novelska and Pobieda, but also, uh, or it doesn't mention Novelska there, but I think it is not. Nova Mekalivka uh, is, is super important for. Um, Kur uh, Kurokova we'll just go there in a second so essentially good news about uh, Krasnoharivka from the Ukrainian point of view uh, Pobieda the, the claim is that they possibly the Ukrainians have possibly pushed the Russians back out of half of Pobieda too and again that's going to be super important I, I keep talking about that with regard to uh, Kostantinivka which is important for Vuhledar and for retaining c control over this whole uh, salient there that's a very important neck of the woods because it allows them to get high Mars onto the outskirts of Mariupol. If we look at where a high Mars might be positioned, um, get the uh, ruler here. So you might put a high, high Mars, something like that. And there you've got 77. Uh, so if we, oops, oh dear, what have I done? Um, oh, well, you get the idea. So that that's going to uh, be able to hit... Uh, there you go. Certainly the outskirts of Mariupol, possibly a bit challenging to hit the centre or the coastal side. Uh, but yeah, good stuff that the 
um, that the Ukrainians are fighting hard to keep the Russians out of uh, Pobieda, if that is indeed the case. Uh, the Russians want Kurikovi. That's one of their main targets. Andrew Pepech has long been saying that, uh, and it's, it seems to be evidenced by the fact that they are trying to flatten it with aviation. However, they have lost. The Russians have lost three Su-34 bombers today, fighter bombers today. That is another tremendous uh, lost to their to the VKS to their um, air force. So Ukraine is doing a really good job uh, of of hammering the Russian air, air force, presumably with Patriot missiles. And there's some talk that they've got adapted Patriot interceptors that are allowing them to to do that to maybe get uh, greater range. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about exactly how they're doing that. Uh, right now we come to the southern uh, front line. We're going to go to Veliko Novosilka, and there's interestingly a bit of a blue um, pin to put there. Now I think that might have bit happened since. Uh, where are we? Eleven twenty-two. Oh no, uh, that might have been yesterday's one. So I said yesterday there was a blue pin, and I said, oh, there isn't a tweet yet, and this came out later. And I did say it would probably come out later. So corrections were made uh, at the forest north of Priyutne. Uh, which is, was eventually recovered by Ukrainian army. On the other hand, um, the Russian army launched a new attack northeast of it, forcing Ukrainian forces to retreat towards the road between Rivnipil and Staromirsky. So a bit of push and shove there, although it's not really a push from Ukrainians. It seems to be a, uh, as, as I said yesterday, a correction, or as I probably said yesterday, because usually at the moment when the Russians on the attack, and there are blue pins from Surat maps, it entails that, that actually they made a mistake by and large, and they're just readjusting. However, I don't think that is a, well, it might be the case here, but I don't think so in Robotna, because I genuinely think the the Ukrainians are pushing back in this area, which is somewhat surprising, because like I've said before, I don't think that this has any intrinsic value here, other than being a buffer zone to Orokiv. So I guess if they ceded this too easily to Russia, then Russia would be able to absolutely hammer Orokiv, and they want Orokiv uh, too. So perhaps it's it's it, that is the uh, value that it offers. In you know, the fighting back there allows them to take the fight to the Russians here rather than letting the Russians take it to Orokiv. So you saw it. Map says over the last three days, Ukrainians recovered all the lost positions in Robotna, including the southern trenches, as the Russian army retreated to their original positions north of Novoprokhovka. Now, this is the those trenches that I call the Alien's Head uh, around here because they're, they're, it's two um, zigzags that come out there look like antenna and then bits and pieces around here. So, it look, But anyway, that's been fought over quite a lot it's been it's swapped sides many times but it's good to see that ukrainians have had some success in that area uh, that's for sure indeed uh, getty here says in the robotina area the armed forces of ukraine regained control of the stronghold south of the village about 1.2 square kilometers uh, and that includes that trench line uh, to the south of robotina all the way along there so uh, good news there okay so as we come out of uh, robotina we're going to just pop into um, into the Krinky area. Now, I found find this very interesting indeed. So just to remind you, Krinky is this bridgehead that I think there's only one brigade of Marines now holding out there, uh, considering there were four before. If you remember, I've not heard anything about Pid Stepney, about there supposedly being a, a bridgehead there. And then previously, because actually Lahiri, or the Cossack camps, as it's translated, the the Ukrainians had got in there. I think they, they were, there was talk months back about how they're taking like, a whole bunch of land there. But anyway, it seemed to amount to nothing. And then this comes out today, which is a, this is a period of time where I'm expecting the Ukrainians to just you know, pack up and, and go back across the river because they've, they've exacted a huge cost on the, on the Russians here. But you wonder how much longer they can continue doing that when they're down to one brigade. Comrade Saldo, uh, Krinky is not clear. So this is coming from a Russian uh, Russian source. Krinky is not cleared. In addition, the enemy is present in Kasachi Lahiri in the east, but they haven't connected to the troops in, the, in Krinky. We won't get far on lies. In other words, let's not lie and, and fool ourselves let's be honest about where the ukrainians are russian war blogger call sign Osetin reports known for having contacts fighting in the occupied parts of the kherson region so it could well be that the ukrainians do have a bridgehead somewhere in kozachi lahiri uh, and and that is a separate bridgehead to the one in krinky and there's no connection between them but you know it is worth worth 
knowing that that could be the case or it might not i don't know and that's the end of the frontline update for today a couple of things to say first of all a correction from earlier i in my geopolitical segment i was reading some marjorie taylor green uh comments this is great though because it's pose law if you don't know what pose law is pose law is an internet law that that you know when people are being uh, create parody accounts if quite often you can't tell that they're parody accounts because they're so close to the truth and that just goes to show how distorted reality is these days that, that a parody is easily confusable with truth. Well, I did Marjorie Taylor Greene a few comments to her about no more money to Ukraine. And someone pointed out that was actually a Marjorie Taylor Greene parody account. And it is. However, that's what she said. So I'm not really, <laughs> I'm not really sure why it's a parody account because literally she says that every day. So it almost doesn't make any difference. Um, so there you go. Because all, all, all I was pointing out, she said no more money to Ukraine. And her, her genuine account has said that too. So you know, whatever. Uh, but I do, I must correct that because, you know, I don't want to disinform you. Oh, I'm sorry, misinform you accidentally. Uh, so th that's that. The other thing, um, I love this. Just, it's great. So uh, Mark here says, Mark B says, I'm in Tucson, Arizona currently visiting some family and watching the F-16s flying over because that's where the, the F-16s have their training there. Send it. Also, JP, I'm so cool. I'm still listening to your videos whilst walking around the Grand Canyon. Uh, thanks. I love that he wins the internet today for listening to my podcast while or my ramblings while he's walking around the Grand Canyon. Can anyone beat that? It's just a, a challenge to you guys. I don't want to hear you listen to me naked in a bath, although I'm pretty sure you do. I wouldn't blame you. Uh, no, but <laughs> where are you going with this? If you've got any uh, weird places you've been listening to me or great places, awesome places, uh, let me know. Um, just for no reason that it passes the time of day. Uh, take care, everybody. Speak soon. Toodle pips.